Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're gonna talk about common sense modifications to self-defense handguns. Now, it goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice. But when we talk about modifications to self-defense guns, uh, we can use a lot of common sense in factoring in what makes sense, what doesn't. And the reason I bring this up is because there are schools of thought that exist uh, on the internet. I, you know, the internet's a thing. We have to accept that that's where most of our discussions are going to take place. That allows us that instant connectivity that we didn't have as a shooting community 10, 15, 20, so on and so forth years ago. Uh, the information used to be funneled very tightly through specific gun magazines. Later on, we had forums, and then Facebook and, and things of that nature were born, and now we have just this perfect terrible beautiful thing in between Instagram and Twitter and still forums still exist there's still some gun magazines out there that are still chugging along uh, we've got all these different avenues for people to communicate and to share good and bad advice um, now I am not the uh, the end-all be-all subject matter expert on uh, modifications uh, or advice on modifications for self-defense handguns but I can give you uh, just my view on things in case you're curious as to how I look at things and what I consider to be common sense and what I consider to be foolish. Because firearms is an industry, uh, there's a bunch of associated industries that provide accessories, aftermarket parts, uh, enhancements, and gimmicks uh, for the firearms that you own or firearms that you may want to purchase. So those are just popular brands out there. And when it comes to self-defense, some of those accessories make a lot of sense. And some of them may just be there um, almost as an impulse buy, like that candy bar right before you check out at the supermarket. There are a lot of things that go into common sense decisions when it comes to your firearm. What modifications are going to benefit you, what modifications are just gimmicks, and what modifications do people worry about getting them in trouble uh, in the event that they have a self-defense shooting. Now before we get into this, let me lay out some numbers to kind of to lay the foundation. Bear with me for a second. Uh, we're thinking about um, people with knowledge of a use of force, people that could give prudent advice on situations. Let's look at the military first. 7.3% uh, of the living population uh, is served in the military. 0.4% um, of that roughly currently serving. 5.5 uh, million living people uh, served in a peacetime military. Uh, they never saw any combat, uh, any documented combat. Um, the actual ratio of combat in, in combat zones, take Iraq for example, um, the tooth to tail ratio uh, in 2005 was 40%, but it's really hard to quantify if 40% of those people actually physically saw combat or they were just in a combat zone. Uh, there's a lot of numbers thrown around out there of how many people actually see combat, 0.45%, I'm sure you've seen the patch is a very popular one. Let's just say for the sake of argument that it's, it's as high as 1% of serving military is actually engaged in combat with another human being. 1% of the population, 1%. Um, some statistical sample data's margin of error is 1%. So what about law enforcement? Uh, law enforcement, there are one point, roughly, approximately, again, 1.3 million law enforcement in the United States. That's 0.4% of the population. Now, that doesn't account for, cause, uh, account for retired officers because there's no real uh, reliable data on how many of those officers are out there. Uh, how often does law enforcement use force? Uh, if you look at the data from 2008 uh, of the 40 million people who reported or, or were polled as making contact with law enforcement, 1.4% had force used against them or had force threatened against them based on uh, the situation. Now, according to the FBI, there were 410 uses of lethal force by law enforcement in 2012. 410. Uh, the FBI has put roughly estimation puts it at about 400 per year and again that's self-reporting data so it's not completely correct but it's plus or minus there's a there's a good it's a good solid number uh, statistics are never perfect uh, the violence policy center said that there were 230 lethal use of forces by citizens in the same year 230 so that brings us to what 640 640 uses of lethal force now where am I going with all of this well where I'm going is is in a country of 321 million we don't have a whole lot of people with first-hand knowledge of the use of lethal force walking around. There just aren't that many people who have actually used lethal force. Now, there's plenty of people who threaten lethal force, uh, either it be by occupation or, or just circumstance, 
But in a country where, let's say, 228 million people annually go to movies, we only have just over 11.1 million CCW permits. Of course, if you add open carriers and people who just own guns for home defense into that mix, you have a lot more people who are self-defense minded. But at the end of the day, that guy clacking away on the keyboard giving you advice on why you shouldn't put a four pound trigger in your gun may not know, and let's be honest, what the fuck he's talking about. If you want legal advice, ask a lawyer. They exist for that reason. Now, not all lawyers know gun law, but there are lawyers out, lawyers out there that specifically, um, they, they basically advertise themselves as pro-2A, pro-self-defense lawyers. You've got Legal Defense Fund and other organizations out there that can give you solid advice on if something is prudent and makes sense. Now, I already said it once, I'm gonna say it again. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I am gonna give you just my basic advice and we're gonna use just common sense to really lay a foundation for what's prudent and what isn't. First, first, the uh, I know a guy. People will tell you they had a friend or a buddy or maybe they even cite a specific uh, article saying that this guy was, this guy got in trouble because he had this modification done to his gun or, or this or you hear from another instructor or someone who's considered a subject matter expert. If you do the research, Google is an amazing thing um, and then there's law specific search sites out there like Find Law and Justia and things like that. Um, look for the cases. Look for someone who's been found criminally guilty, as in guilty of, of, of crime or found civilly liable for common sense modifications to handguns. Common sense modifications to self-defense guns. Can you get in trouble for that? Yeah, you can. If you remove manufacturer's uh, safety features. There have been cases where people modified a gun or removed safety features where the gun's discharge injured or killed someone and they were found civilly liable or even uh, criminally negligent and they, they were convicted of a crime. Now that being said, if I use a weapon in self-defense, um, say I use you know a modified Glock, and it's a good shoot, then it's a good shoot. Um, it can be a good shoot with a completely illegal weapon because those would be two separate charges. Now, of course, that would complicate things, I would think, um, but it can be a factor. So with the, uh, I know a guy, There's say there's one example, one example of a guy who had a stipple job and that was used against him in court and somehow that led to him being found either criminally guilty, I don't know how that would happen, or civilly liable, which is a little bit more possible because the, the burden of proof is lower in civil cases. It's only roughly 51% or preponderance of the evidence is what they call it. So that one case, that's one case out of how many a year? Beware of statistically small sample data. Just because it happens once does not mean that is going to set the pace till the end of time. If you want to look at sample data, you have to look at a wider pool. Um, it's very easy to make statistics say whatever you want them to say based on how you word the question or how big your sample pool is. If I only talk to a thousand people, that does not give me a temperature for a wide degree of opinions. It just gives me a temperature based on how I set up the statistical data and maybe I could be geographically specific. If you ask how many people are, how many, if you ask a thousand people how many are you are Bears fans and you're in Chicago, your data is going to be skewed versus San Diego. These things matter, but sometimes we don't think about it because we just look at the numbers and we assume that they're correct and they're incredulous or they're they're credible, I should say, or maybe even credulous, whatever. Um, and we just assume and we take it on good faith that this information is 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 unbiased as possible, and it might not be. And we in the gun community we run the risk of being biased, just like anybody else does, based on the way we look at things. So that one guy who cites that one article. Um, do you know what occurred during the court case? Have you read the minutes? Have you have you actually done the time to put in the research? Because if this is a topic you care about, don't just care about it passingly. Actually look into it. If you're taking someone's advice, do your due diligence and try to find out as much information as you can to make a prudent and conscious decision on if A or B. Uh, if if someone says, "Hey, I wouldn't I wouldn't run a uh, I wouldn't run a, a four pound trigger because I heard of a guy who who got in trouble for that." Um, I would want more specific information uh, based on that advice, especially if it's somebody I'm just talking to on the internet. I don't even know this guy. His screen name is like Buzzsaw Killer 44 or, you know, uh, Two Glocks 9. You know, I need to know the information is credible and I need to know the information is, is as objective as possible. So I want to know specifically what he's talking about and I want him to be able to specifically cite or I should be able to Google it and find it myself. Um, whatever I have to do to find out, okay, does that information pertain or is he incorrect or is he just full of shit 
or what is the case? I need to know. I'm not going to take it on face value. That information is going to drive the way I modify my firearms. Uh, of course, next up is um, the, the, the law enforcement uh, angle. Um, don't use this ammo or this modification because cops don't use it or I only use ammo that cops carry. Uh, that's not necessarily bad uh, if you choose your self-defense round blindly based on what the local law enforcement agency uses because they probably got a smoking deal on it. That's fine. Um, but did you actually bother to put in the to work and find out, okay, why do they use that round? Is that round, you know, does it pass the FBI standards? Uh, and are there other departments not using that round for whatever reason? Don't just blindly use stuff. Uh, it goes back to just personal due diligence. How much, how lazy or how much time do you want to put into this? How serious are you going to take your self-defense? And how serious are you going to take the, the potential, or I should say that, the, 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 well, let's go with potential, the potential of you being in a self-defense shooting and being able to articulate why you chose that round because if the round comes into question um, and they're like, well, why do you use this bullet? And be like, oh, well, the cops use it. And? See where I'm going with this? Like, you have to be able to articulate every decision you make. And as long as you can articulate to a common standard, a common sense standard, the decisions you make and the equipment that you use and the modifications that you make, then you, shouldn't ha you should have a much easier road of any potential litigation in the future. So when it comes to round choice, just because your local law enforcement agency uses it or just because your buddy who's a cop or this other guy you know who knows a cop or this one guy you ran into at the NRA show or the gun store who's a cop, he uses this round, um, do some research that round, see if it's on the FBI's approved list and see how much data out there is about it. So if somebody asks you, hey, why, why do you use this bullet? You can articulate, not just, well, cops use it. You can say, well, it met this standard and it did this and these law enforcement agencies use it and they found over a long period of time that the round's performance was uh, highly advantageous versus other rounds. Now you're getting into more articulable facts versus just the conclusion or, or the statement that, well, you know, my local cops use it and it's good enough for them and they know what they're doing because they're cops, so I just went ahead and went with that round. Firearm modifications specifically. What modifications are prudent and what modifications don't make sense? First of all, any kind of moto or machismo uh, additions to your firearm are not common sense. They do not add to the effectiveness or the modularity of the firearm, so they shouldn't be included. Uh, just as an example, uh, Glock, the back plates. If it says Molon Lab or you're fucked or smile and wait for flash or any of that nonsense, go ahead and take that off the gun and replace it with something else. Those are not common sense additions to the firearm. They're more of an accoutrement. Uh, there's something you do to impress your buddies at the range or just because you like it, and that's fine. But I don't think that you should carry that gun for self-defense because while that part isn't illegal, um, and while that part doesn't actually increase or decrease the effectiveness subjectively of the firearm, that gun, if you use it in self-defense, is going to be evidence and that could be used against you. Um, Mow and Labe, I'm not really sure, you know, but if it says smile and wait for flash, I could see a prosecutor or in a civil case, uh, an attorney basically using that as saying, hey, this guy really wanted to shoot people. Again, I'm not a lawyer, uh, I'm not going to pretend to be, but my common sense tells me that that modification serves no functional purpose and if it doesn't serve a functional purpose I have no use for it on my firearm. So now that we've gotten that out of the way let's talk about functional um, modifications or accessories. My personal carry gun is a uh, Agency Arms Field 19. There are a few modifications made to this firearm that aid in increasing effectiveness and accuracy for the platform. Every single one of these accessories going down the road or in any situation, I need to be able to articulate why they exist and what advancement they provide and defend against any uh, uh, negative connotations that they could present based on you know, evil appearance or, or what have you. So let's just give a rundown on what we're looking at and see just how uh, complicated or, or difficult the common sense factor is to this. Firearms enhancement and modifications. First up, let's talk about this weapon light. Uh, how do I justify the addition of a weapon light? It shouldn't even be an issue, but since it is, we'll talk about it. Positive target identification. While maintaining a two-handed grip control on this firearm for safety, I want to use two hands whenever possible, the light allows for positive target identification in all lighting conditions, mainly low light conditions, because in daylight you don't have to use it. Uh, it allows me to maintain that two-handed firing grip while slightly modifying and using this weapon light. Another advantage to a weapon light is it may be a last second deterrent against a threat. I draw this gun, I activate this weapon light, I hit them in the eyes with it to remove their visual horizon. That may diffuse the situation or cause the threat to rethink their attack. So this is a huge advantage. We want this. Knowledgeable information is given to the shooter via the weapon light in low light conditions. Easily justified. Next up, 
the red dot. Uh, this is a point of contention for some people. They say just having it on there makes you appear this way or that way. This allows for one focal plane shooting versus the traditional three focal plane shooting we use with iron sights. Now, why is that an issue? With a red dot sight, handgun or rifle, I focus on the threat. The threat remains crisp, clean, clear, and in focus. I superimpose the dot over my desired point of impact, and that is how I shoot. The advantage with this is that allows me to maintain a physical focus on the threat at all times. So if there's a small change in their behavior that would keep me from using force, I will see it versus maybe potentially not seeing it when I'm focused on my front sight and my threat is slightly buried. Again, it's a small pedantic little thing, but that's one way I can justify the addition of this optic. Another way I can justify the addition of this optic is it allows for more accurate gunfire. It allows for more accurate and faster shooting. It allows me to increase my ability to shoot accurately and that therefore shoot more safe if I have to shoot. Next up, slide modifications. Front and rear serrations on this Agency 19. Those go to control. I want to be able to safely control my firearm, safely manipulate my firearm, whatever I happen to be doing. Uh, so I want those on there. They go to grip, surface, control, avoid slipping, things like that. The only aesthetic feature really is that A that agency puts on there. That's their logo. We live in a capitalist society. Every company wants to put their logo on their product, their modified product, what have you. So that's easily explained. That's just their logo. I didn't ask for them to put that there. It just exists. Stipple. Uh, grip. It's a grip thing. If you look at OSHA regulations for, for restaurants and things like that, or you look at stairs in public buildings, or even on sidewalks now, we have those grip surfaces to prevent people from slipping and falling. This is the same thing. We want to be able to maintain a sure grip on the firearm to, uh, regardless of the conditions in which we're in, be it sweat, mud, blood, water, what have you. This allows for a sure grip on the firearm. Undercuts and things like that, those just go to ergonomics and, and the ease in which the firearm is able to be controlled, which enhances safety and reliability uh, and operation. Slide release, slide stop, slide release, whatever you want to call that on the Glock. Uh, ease of, ease of, enhanced controls for ease of operation, easily justified, no big deal there. Um, finally, we have the trigger. Now, my carry gun has a four pound flat face agency trigger on it. How do I justify the trigger? Well, I'm gonna talk about the trigger separately because the trigger is usually the biggest point of contention, contention when we talk about self-defense firearm. Trigger weight is a big topic of contention, as I already mentioned. People like to argue what is, how light is too light. There is such a thing as too light. However, there is also such a thing as too heavy. Uh, if you look at the, the uh, NYPD, uh, New York City Police Department, they run a, uh, the New York trigger on their Glocks. Uh, it's like 12 pounds and you'll see that that definitely affects their accuracy. I've had NYPD officers in my classes when I teach up in the Northeast and their accuracy suffers under speed because of that trigger. And you say, well, slow it down a little bit. Well, in self-defense shooting, sometimes your trigger speed is, is not up to you, especially if you're afraid, because you might be. It's a very real possibility that you will feel objective fear in a self-defense shooting. So they're running those guns pretty fast. And then you look at their accuracy when you hear about a New York shooting, they shoot, shoot a guy 26 times. Uh, to stop him or they fire 48 rounds and get X amount of hits. That's not a knock on, on the individual officer so much as a knock on their lack of training because police officers don't receive nearly as much training as they need to uh, and the fact that they have this common this nonsensical 12 pound trigger in their gun. Uh, uh, Department of Justice Bureau of Prisons almost nationwide uses a double action only Ruger handgun because when they want when someone shoots they want to make sure they mean it. They want to make sure they meant to pull that trigger. And I get that, but at the same time, like if you're gonna trust someone with a firearm, if you're gonna train them and trust them with a firearm, then you should have faith in them that they're going to be responsible with it and they're only gonna use it when they need to use it. Now, if you're including that heavy trigger because you don't wanna train them uh, and you wanna save money on training, then that is a totally separate negligent issue for which you should be at least, at the very least, civilly liable. At the most, you should be viol uh, in violation of their civil rights under training. What is that 18 USC 1983 violation of civil rights under color of authority? That would be cool if those trainers actually faced charges under that under that uh, particular federal code, because I would consider them to be negligent in the training of their officers by saying, let's just give them a heavier trigger instead of providing them with better training. Sorry, a little bit of a tangent. I get a little hot when I think about that. Uh, totally different subject. But how light is too light for a self-defense handgun? Um. Like I said, I use a four pound trigger. Uh, I don't see a significant advantage from four to 3.5. Uh, I think three and getting into below that is a little nonsensical. I need trigger weight that is light, but provides consistent pressure all the way through the trigger cycle. I want my take up, my break, my reset, 
everything to be consistent. And in order for it to be consistent, there has to be enough weight, enough retention, uh, enough resistance in the trigger pull and the springs and how everything works together to provide that. Four pounds for me has always been a good number. Now Glocks come in at like 5.5 and they say don't mess with stock triggers. What's the advantage to a lighter trigger over a stock trigger? Well, for me, a four pound trigger allows for just a little bit more fi finesse in running the gun a little bit faster and shooting slightly accurately, slightly more accurately. And I mean slightly, very slightly. The uh, reason being, there's less resistance, less uh, movement transferred to that trigger during my press versus a heavier trigger. Those of you who have double action, single action guns, you know that first trigger pull on double action, on the double action, when the hammer's forward, you gotta pull that hammer all the way back. It does kind of unsettle your point of aim, depending on practice, through the break. Uh, on a striker fired gun, one of the reasons I love striker fired guns is the trigger pull is consistent every single time. And I like that trigger pull to be consistent and a little bit lighter. So how can I justify that lighter trigger pull? Well, first, um, just what I said, I want it to allow for consistent control and I want the trigger press to provide or to allow minimal disturbance of my sight picture through stress tremors introduced into the firearm during my press. So my, my convulsive grip, if I'm afraid or if I'm just under stress or what have you, or if that's just naturally the way I grip the gun, I wanna be able to isolate as much as possible my trigger pull and only involve the minimal amount of muscles necessary to get that break and fire that first round versus needing to engage more of a uh, convulsive grip to get the gun to fire. Can a light trigger cause a negligent discharge? You know what causes negligent discharges? Negligence. If you have a negligent discharge on an eight pound trigger, you probably would have had it on a four pound trigger. If you had a negligent discharge on a four pound trigger, you probably would have had it on an eight pound trigger. Your finger was on the trigger when it wasn't supposed to be. Now, uh, they looked at this in law enforcement years ago when, when revolvers were still a thing and uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center actually did a study on it. They looked at startle response and, and convulsive reflex, how people can tense up under startle. They found that a convulsive, a convulsive startle can result in 25 pounds of pressure. So unless you have a 26 pound trigger, if your finger was on the trigger when it wasn't supposed to be, that causes a negligent discharge in that, in that instance. So trigger weight in that situation would be completely irrelevant. On the other side of the coin though, I don't want a trigger so light that if I barely put pressure on it, it goes off because I wanna be able to set the trigger under certain conditions. I wanna be able to press out get a finger on that trigger and if I'm issuing verbal commands or if I'm just about to break that shot, I want the ability to have a little bit of play so I can change my mind. I don't want the gun to go off as soon as I put my finger on the trigger. So there's a little bit of room there that we have to play with. I like a four pound trigger. You may like a four or five. You make a five, you may be fine with a five, five pound trigger. But the fact remains, you shouldn't be telling people not to use these triggers if there's no justifiable evidence to that fact. If you look for civil cases, or criminal cases involving striker-fired handguns with modified triggers, I think you'll find that there aren't any. There's some for revolvers and there's some for removing safety features, but I have not been able to find a single case in which someone was found civilly liable or criminally negligent in the use of a professionally modified trigger that did not remove, remove the safety features from a firearm. I haven't been able to find it. If you know of one, please let me know, but then we've got one. Let's say people comment in, hey, this case, this case, this case. Now we got three. Remember what we said in the beginning of the video, we talked about sample size. Let's think about that. So in closing, I guess what we want to be able to do is just be able to articulate why we make the decisions we make. So what I've just done is given you my articulation for the modifications I use in my firearm. That's how I would explain it to my attorney if I was involved in a, in a, in a uh, self-fence shooting. Hey man, if you don't know anything about guns, let me tell you why I did these things to my gun. Um, I'll be able to show him everything, walk him through the process, put him in touch with people he can talk to, the guys that actually did the work, things like that. Because I take my, my after the shooting just as seriously as I take getting into or before the shooting. I love the practice, I love the training, I love the mindset stuff, but I'm also very concerned with how's it gonna go after the fact, because we live in a very litigious society. You can get sued over anything. And if you shoot someone, you can expect, based on state, circumstance, context, and situation, to be sued. So put as much work into what you're going to do in the event that you are sued as you put into going to the range and actually firing rounds and being, you know, all uh, moto about it. Um, best thing you can do, again, independent research. Somebody says something, try to independently verify it, just like you should independently verify everything I've said in this video. Uh, if it doesn't meet the common sense fact, 
uh, test. If you cannot articulate its addition to the firearm, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, if you can, then think about is this something I really need or is it something I just want because some of these other guys have it and I want to be, I want to be cool too. Um, there's nothing wrong with that also as long as you can articulate its addition to the firearm. Uh, I guess in closing, I would say just just make common sense decisions and, and you know take the time to talk to a lawyer about this stuff. You know, find a lawyer that, that in the event that you get a shooting, this might be the guy you choose to represent you. Uh, you need to go that far. You need to be prepared for that. And of course, that you know that's a su uh, subject for a totally different video. But take those steps to be prepared for after the shooting, not just during the shooting. Be able to articulate the decisions you made on your firearm. If you are going to modify your carry gun, be able to articulate them. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Modify and articulate accordingly.